It was a wonderful scene here last weekend. The church was humming with life. There were tours taking place throughout the building in three languages. There were people enjoying a leisurely lunch in the garden or on the square. There were children running through the building and beyond looking for treasure. Many of you were buzzing around and helping out in one way or another. It was a good celebration of this building and its 250 years here on the Bourg de Four. And we got some attention in the local press from the occasion as well. I don't know if you saw the article in the Tribune de Genève that ran just before the weekend. There was some good information there and some not so good information. They got the <laughs> location of our Sunday worship wrong. The photographs they printed were very lovely. But the headline of the article is what I keep thinking about. Belle et discrète, l'église luthérienne a 250 ans. If you want to get me worked up, just tell me you think the church should be beautiful and discreet. <laughs> Out of the way, not making a scene, just an attractive part of the background of life and society. I don't mean to be too hard on the author of the article. He was probably referring to the building, which is, after all, certainly very beautiful and I think also quite discreet. You know as well as I do that people can pass through Geneva for years and not know that this place is a church. It's a lovely and fine part of the scenery here. I know, he was probably calling the building beautiful and discreet, but behind those words I hear a common perception of what church and Christian life as a whole are meant to be. Faith is all right, as long as it's taken in moderation, as long as it doesn't ask me to change anything in my life as long as it doesn't interfere with the really important things, like my career and my prejudices and the way I spend my money. Faith is all right, as long as it's beautiful and discreet. The problem is that faith, as it's lived out and embodied and spoken about in the Bible, isn't really like that. It is certainly beautiful at times, but it is almost never discreet. A couple of weeks ago, we started reading from Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia, and we noted right away that if you want lessons in being discreet, Paul is not your teacher. <laughs> Instead of the characteristic warm words of thanksgiving for this community, Paul starts the letter with a blast of confrontation. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you in the grace of Christ. He writes, just six verses in. Paul is worked up about the situation in Galatia, and he makes no effort to politely hide that. Today's reading from that same letter helps to explain just what he is so worked up about. Just before the passage we read today, Paul describes an encounter with Peter. The two cross paths in the town of Antioch, and we get a glimpse of just what a challenge it was to bring the early church together. Both Paul and Peter have found themselves drawn into this new reality that God is bringing Gentiles into the Christian community. While this whole business began as a group of Jewish people following a Jewish teacher, it's become clear that the movement is for everyone, Jews and non-Jews alike. Both Peter and Paul have been drawn into that reality, but just what that looks like in practice is still a work in progress. While most of the time, while most of the people seem to agree that Gentiles have a place in the Christian community, some in the church believe that following Jesus also requires fidelity to practices of the Jewish law, like circumcision and dietary laws and keeping Jewish festivals. 
they maintain that Gentiles need to do these things too. And Peter, it seems, is waffling a little bit. Maybe he's uncertain about the right pastoral approach to that difficult question. Maybe he's not sure about the place of Jewish laws and traditions within the community himself. Whatever the reason, Peter has stopped eating with, Jew with Gentiles in Antioch. He is drawing a line between Jewish Christians and their dietary practices and Gentiles and theirs. And Paul is not amused. He stands up in the middle of this church potluck dinner and accuses Peter in front of everyone. How can you do this? How can you persist in these divisions within the community? There's nothing discreet about Paul's behavior or about the message that he has to share. For Paul, Christ changes everything. Christ's life, death, and resurrection are not simply part of the scenery of life. This is a new center around which everything else orbits. That's why the distinctions made by the law can no longer exist. Christ's faithfulness to God's purposes and the community's trust in him are sufficient. They're enough, and they are now the center. And we have come to believe in Christ Jesus, Paul writes, so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law. He goes on to say it in even stronger terms. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This kind of faith, faith that demands a death to self and a new center for life, this kind of faith can never be just part of the scenery. There is nothing discreet about it. And we probably shouldn't be too surprised then to find that those who are caught up in this kind of faith aren't often particularly discreet about it either. You find disciples who drop their nets by the seashore and leave everything and follow. You find a tax collector who takes half of what he has and gives it away. You find a woman who is so overcome with gratitude that she walks into a dinner party she isn't invited to and kneels at Jesus' feet and washes them with her hair right there in front of the respectable, appalled guests. It all stems from Jesus, of course, the divinely indiscreet one. Today we find him willing, as always, to make the comfortable less so, defending this woman publicly and telling a parable that invites everyone into thinking about what true devotion really looks like. The only polite one, the only one with any decorum and discretion is the Pharisee hosting the gathering, muttering to himself quietly about Jesus and his poor prophetic skills. Maybe another way to say all of this is to say that Christian faith will make you eccentric. We tend to think of that as sort of a polite way to say weird, <laughs> but at its root, it really means off-center. For a person of faith, it means that something else finds its way to your center, Christ at work in you. And it also means that you find your way to a different way of being in the world, out of step with materialism, injustice, indifference, out of center, eccentric. I don't know if that's exactly what you signed up for, Neda and Nini, when you indicated your desire to be baptized. I don't know if you had in mind that you wanted to become more eccentric, <laughs> that you wanted to have your old self and your old center thrown off course and your life reordered. But I actually think you know quite a bit about this already. God has already been at work in your lives for some time in dramatic and powerful ways. You already know perfectly well that God's work in us is not always discreet. There is something a little bit crazy about standing up and saying you are ready to be crucified with Christ. And yet that's exactly what you're saying this morning. You are coming forward to these waters that promise to drown the old self in you and bring about a new life with Christ at your center. Please don't get me wrong about this whole Christians shouldn't be discreet thing. In this era of polarized opinions and polarizing talk, I don't mean that Christians shouldn't be civil. Paul standing up and shouting in the middle of dinner probably shouldn't be our model. <laughs> but now is very much a time for Christians to take our faith seriously. 
to embrace the transformation that Christ means to work in us, to be out of step with all that is wrong in the world, to embody that reconciliation and grace that Christ brings. I read a short article this last week with the title, How God Messed Up My Happy Atheist Life. <laughs> the author was unwavering in her atheism for years until she unexpectedly found herself drawn into Christian community and faith. And as you can imagine from the title, she has a pretty good sense of humor about it. She describes her new life in Christ in vivid terms. I never possessed much chill, to be honest, she says. Now I have none whatsoever. My Christian conversion has granted me no simplicity. It has complicated all of my relationships, changed how I feel about money, messed up my public persona, and made me wonder if I should be on Twitter at all. <laughs> Obviously, she adds at the end, it's been very beautiful. Nini and Neda, you know something about this. You know that when Christ shows up in your life, when Christ becomes the new center, things don't just stay where they always were. That's what we find in the baptized life again and again. Baggage that we are asked to leave behind. Good things we are asked to give away. Acts of wild grace that we are called on to do. It's all another way of saying that Jesus doesn't really do discreet. Following him is demanding, unsettling, disorienting, reorienting. But following him, finding him at your center, is also life and freedom and joy. Friends, that is the gift. And yes, it is very beautiful. Amen. <laughs>